We've all heard the forecast that if only women ruled the world, it would be a much more peaceful place with a much different approach to international affairs, despite the fact that female Prime Ministers Margaret Thatcher, Indira Gandhi, and Golda Meir all led their countries into war. A University of Toronto political scientist has put four of the world's most famous female foreign policy actors, two Republicans, two Democrats, under her microscope. Her conclusions are in her new book, Women as Foreign Policy Leaders, National Security and Gender Politics in Superpower America. And its author, Sylvia Bashevkin, joins us now for more. Nice to have you back here, Sylvia. Thank you. We're going to go through all four women that you've chronicled in the book, and then we'll okay. come to the overarching conclusions you made at the end. Let's start with, and we'll bring up picture number one right here, who's Jean Kirkpatrick? Well, Jean Kirkpatrick was a political science professor at Georgetown University. Uh, she was appointed by Ronald Reagan to be the first woman to represent the United States at the United Nations. Uh, she was a lifelong Democrat, much like Reagan earlier in his life. Um, and she made a massive difference to America's profile at the UN. She was far more uh, assertive, particularly in her relations with the Soviet Union and its allies uh, than the Carter administration representatives had been. And I think she really helped to uh, shape what we know as the Reagan Doctrine. So Ronald Reagan would not and could not have been as tough on communism without Gene Kirkpatrick nudging him from behind? Is that Well, partly? I don't think he would have been as articulate and well-defined. I think she was the architect who really was able to breathe life into many of the ideas that she and Reagan shared. They were both uh, New Deal Democrats who had kind of lost uh, patience with the Democratic Party. Uh, Kirkpatrick became a, a leading neoconservative intellectual in the 1970s. Uh, one of Reagan's um, advisors uh, read uh, some of her work in Commentary magazine, and she was uh, catapulted to the top of the Reagan Foreign Policy Advisory Group. Was her being a female in a very macho administration, and remember, we're going back now Early 35 years, years. yeah, uh, was that a hindrance to her? Well, she saw it in many respects as allowing her to stand out. Uh, she never realized uh, until she got to the UN that there'd never been a woman representing a major power at the UN. So she didn't think about it too much, but she was certainly aware of it. And she talks in uh, various interviews and in her memoirs about being the only woman in that group. And she said there were a lot of Marines, she said, in the Reagan administration, and she wasn't one of them. Well, here we go. I mean, George Shultz, Caspar Weinberger, Alexander Haig, I mean, these were the certainly higher profile men at the time, all of whom you tell us barely mention her at all in their memoirs. What does that tell you? Well, it tells us that she got under the skin of some of them. <laughs> certainly, George Shultz mentions her and uh, tells us all, as readers, that he told Reagan not to promote her. Uh, not to give her the National Security Advisor job because she was not a dispassionate advisor. Now, to me, that suggests that George Shultz disagreed with her a lot, along many lines. Um, but it seems to me that, uh, you know, Kirkpatrick had to, had to make her way in a place where there had been no women before at that level. She was the only woman in Reagan's first cabinet, <laughs> not just the only foreign woman in the foreign policy team. Um, but she certainly uh, knew her way around her. Uh, her background from Georgetown, the fact that her husband, Evan Kirkpatrick, was a very well-connected Washington insider, I think, helped her a great deal. And she was a passionate advocate for her views and a very well-spoken decision-maker. Okay. So I think that, that helped her move ahead. La she's a Republican, obviously. Let's do a Democrat. Madeleine Albright is the second woman you chronicle in the book. Who was Madeleine Albright? Well, Madeleine Albright also taught uh, political science at Georgetown University. Uh, she was a child of uh, Czech immigrants to the United States. Her father had been a very senior Czech diplomat. She'd been uh, a refugee twice by the time she was 11 years old. And she worked in the Clinton administration, having been brought to Bill Clinton's attention, uh, in large part by one of her students uh, from Georgetown, who was on Clinton's transition team. And she was the first female Secretary of State ever? She was. She was. Unlike Kirkpatrick, she managed to be promoted from the rank of UN Ambassador to Secretary of State. Now, before she got this job in the Clinton administration, I want to take you back to 1984. So this is more Jean Kirkpatrick's time. And you tell this story in the book. Ted Koppel, the legendary journalist, he's the anchor of Nightline, asks Geraldine Ferraro, who is the vice presidential candidate on the Democrat ticket in 1984, the question he asked was, do you think the Soviets might be tempted to take advantage of you because you're a woman? Now, you would never ask that kind of question today, but again, 30, almost 35 years ago, you did. What kind of impact did that kind of attitude have on Madeleine Albright? I think it had a massive impact. She was Geraldine Ferraro's foreign policy advisor. She traveled in 1984 around the United States with Ferraro. And she also knew uh, other Democrats, including Walter Mondale and Michael Dukakis. 
each of them was really pummeled by the Republicans for being weak on national security. And I think they taught Albright, and she says this in her memoirs, they taught her that you have to be tough and you have to be decisive, and in particular, you have to pronounce your statements very clearly, not leave any ambiguity. And I think uh, President Clinton believed that she was, in fact, responsible for some of the most pointed comments on foreign policy of his entire administration. Well, they called the, the American incursion into the Balkans to deal with that war of the early 1990s, Madeleine's War. What was it about her own background that allowed her to believe in a muscular approach to American foreign policy? Well, I think, first of all, Albright came from that region. She was a, a child of Czechoslovakia. Her father had been Czech ambassador to Yugoslavia. She knew very well the internal politics of Yugoslavia. Her father had written a book about it. Her father had predicted that with the fall of Tito, Yugoslavia would probably implode in ethnic um, conflict of a serious variety. I think that Albright had sat through the very inchoate discussions of the first Clinton administration when Warren Christopher was Secretary of State, the failures in Somalia, the failures in Rwanda. And when it came to her, the region of the world she knew best, she wasn't going to let the United States flounder anymore. So it seems to me she was able to really focus discussion on Bosnia and Kosovo in a way that she was unable to do earlier in her career because she wasn't an expert on Africa. And also she was prepared to let the guys take the lead for some moments of time until she realized that they were actually going nowhere, that the Clinton administration was seriously um, disorganized. And I think most accounts, uh, in retrospect, suggest she was right and that without her focus, Clinton would have never had... Um, the um, ability to lead NATO into those interventions in the former Yugoslavia. Well, one of the guys she talked to was Colin Powell, who I guess was chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the time. Yes. Uh, and he, she said to him, what are you saving this superb military for, Colin, if we can't use it? Do you think she was trigger happy? I don't, I don't. Although Powell says in, in, in his memoirs that she really was ready to cause him an aneurysm, <laughs> right? That he was, he was just appalled. Here she is, a civilian, a woman, and he's a four-star general, and she's telling him what to do. I think that she realized that the consequences of genocide in the Balkans were potentially so devastating for all of Europe that if the United States couldn't bring its allies together on Central Europe, then where on earth was it going to have any influence in this sort of post... Um, post-fall of the Berlin Wall mm. world. Hindsight is always 2020, so she does look back in hindsight at Rwanda and the failure of America to intervene in that conflict, that civil war where millions died, and she calls it the biggest regret of her professional life. Did she get that one wrong? I think, I think she didn't have the clout in the administration at that moment mm. to actually move things forward. Mm. I think she tried very hard. Uh, remember, at that moment, she's UN ambassador. She's trying hard, but she's facing a lot of the problems that other women face. She would call from New York. She tells us in her memoirs, she would get some junior staffer in Washington. Hmm. She often couldn't get her, her points across because she was just diverted. So I think she tried, um, but clearly Clinton feels the same way in terms of the failure on Rwanda. Yeah, he calls it the worst, uh, the worst foreign policy failure of his presidency as well. Okay, let's move on to number three. We're going to go back to the Republican side here, and this is Condoleezza Rice. What do we need to know about her? Well, again, we have a political science professor, actually a, a student of Albright's father, Joseph Corbell. Uh, she had been See teaching... See that again. That's interesting, eh? Madeline Albright's father had been, taught her. Had been her professor yeah. and her, her, her very, very mm -hmm. uh, major mentor, other than mm -hmm. her own father, uh, Rice was closest with Albright's father. Hmm. Uh, what's interesting is Albright expected Rice, as a protege of her father, to be a liberal Democrat, but Rice was a Republican. Uh, she studied at the University of Denver with Joseph Corbell. She got a job at Stanford, became the first ever uh, woman and African-American provost at Stanford, the youngest ever. And then she moved uh, into the advisory capacity, working for George W. Bush's campaign. Uh, for the presidency, brought in by his father, George H.W. Bush, for whom she'd worked um, during a leave from Stanford. Uh, she comes in as a Soviet security specialist, but of course the challenges of the Bush administration largely involved uh, the al-Qaeda attacks of 9-11, Afghanistan and Iraq, regions with which she's not very familiar, and critics argue it showed in the decisions that were made. And yet she became the first female African-American Secretary of State ever, mm -hmm. so the president clearly trusted her, yes? Very much so, and, and I argue in the book that it's unlikely that any of Bush's, George W. Bush's uh, male advisors would have had the patience and focus to see him through that campaign preparation process. He was running against Al Gore, 
Al Gore was a long-term uh, legislator in Washington. He'd been a vice president who sat in on every cabinet meeting, knew everything about foreign policy and climate change and uh, nuclear missiles and you name it. And Rice had Bush so well prepared that a lot of people thought that uh, Bush won the foreign policy debate. She headed up a group in the Bush administration called the Vulcans. Who mm -hmm. were they? The Vulcans were a campaign advisory group who then went on to work for Bush when he became president. And they included people like uh, Donald Rumsfeld, Paul Wolfowitz, uh, men who'd uh, been Dick around Cheney. The, Dick Cheney, uh, who'd been around uh, the foreign policy establishment uh, quite a bit. Uh, Rice uh, named the Vulcans for a, a statue in her hometown of Birmingham, Alabama, and she co-chaired that group uh, with Wolfowitz. Dick Cheney, you tell us in the book, frequently tried to keep her out of the loop so that he could have better access to the president than she would have had. How much success did he have doing that? Well, he had limited success because Condoleezza Rice had access to the president. And everyone in that circle knew that she had more access to the Bush family than any of them. She was the one who was at the Bush family ranch in Texas, uh, their um, summer home up in Maine, Camp David, more than uh, any of the rest of them. So her closeness to Bush, his wife, and his parents, and the extended family exceeded any of theirs. She was the only one other than George W. Bush and Laura Bush who slept in the um, family quarters of the White House on the night of 9-11. Right. So that tells you something about the extent to which she was close, and she could help to keep people like Cheney uh, on something of a leash. How much does she have to wear the responsibility for the accumulated drumbeat that eventually resulted in the invasion of Iraq? Well, I think she was part of an administration that was already leaning that way. We know that many of these advisors were, were, were pressing uh, George H.W. Bush mm -hmm. to do more uh, in Iraq during the uh, first uh, Persian Gulf War. I think she was largely responsible for the uh, sort of intellectual uh, and uh, popular uh, justification for the invasion of Iraq. I think she wears the preemption doctrine. And of course, Colin Powell's the one who presented it uh, to the United Nations, which convinced many Americans and many others uh, that, in fact, it was a wise decision. Let's go back to the Democrats for your fourth female foreign policy leader that you chronicle. And we don't have to go ahead, put the picture up. We don't have to tell anybody who that is. Uh, never in American history has anyone been a first lady, senator, secretary of state, and presidential candidate. There's Hillary Clinton. What did she see as her mission when she was secretary of state? Well, I think Hillary Clinton had a number of different missions. I think she was ready, to, for example, to address China as a rising world power. I think she wanted to rebuild relations with the allies after the Bush years. Uh, and she very much wanted to make women's security a centerpiece of U.S. foreign policy. Uh, so one of the arguments about Hillary Clinton was that there was no village in the world too small for her to visit. <laughs> so she very much pursued an argument that said U.S. national security would be advanced by women's education, women's employment, women's health care around the world. And so she made that a pivot, which I think made her quite distinctive for many of her predecessors. Although many of her critics in the Republican Party used to say, you know, getting frequent flyer miles is not a foreign policy approach. It just gets you a lot of frequent flyer points. Was there something to that criticism? Well, she certainly did fly more than any of her predecessors. She sure did. Um, but on the other hand, Rice and Albright uh, and uh, Kirkpatrick all stood out uh, from their counterparts in those eras because they also traveled a great deal. I mean, to some extent, as a woman in one of these jobs, you kind of do have to keep enforcing the idea that you do hold this position mm -hmm. and that others are going to see you holding it. They're not going to assume uh, that you have the president's ear or that you have the world's ear. Seems to me you have to be out there on the stage and proving it every day. Well, here's part of the Hillary Clinton legacy. She supported the invasion of Iraq, Afghanistan. She supported the Patriot Act, the intervention in Libya, which resulted in Muammar Gaddafi's death. That was during the Obama years, of course. She did highlight women's rights, probably in an unprecedented fashion for a secretary of state. But was she too hawkish for the job? Well, I'm not sure if she was too hawkish, because in some of the areas where I think she wanted to be more assertive, her memoirs and other memoirs suggest that President Obama was not sufficiently confident. He was so concerned about too much intervention, as in Afghanistan and Iraq and the Bush years, that he kind of let the Russians, many people argue, get away with too much in Syria, and that he was too quick to push uh, for the Mubarak um, demise in Egypt. Mm. In other words, Hillary Clinton would have been more, she did advise him to be a little more cautious in terms of some of his responses to the so-called Arab Spring, uh, and that he might have been wise to listen a little bit more instead of not wanting conflict as much as he did. Okay, those are the four women you chronicle, and then here is the conclusion that you come to. Women decision makers, we report, were neither pacifist angels averse to military intervention, nor sudden converts to masculine norms of aggression and belligerence. And I wonder whether you personally 
were disappointed in that conclusion. Well, I wasn't disappointed in it. I think I was more surprised by it because of the assumption in much of the literature of international relations that suggests if you have women leaders, it's really all about consensus building and, and just giving up the store. And I thought, if we look at the evidence, there's very little uh, to support that conclusion with these four cases. In fact, we can argue that within those administrations, these women stood out for often being the most assertive in their response to the circumstances of the time. Certainly, Kirkpatrick was criticized by many men in the Reagan administration, and they pushed her out. We know the second Reagan administration, when she was gone, was much more willing to compromise with the Soviets. Uh, so that in each of these administrations, we see a pattern that suggests that these women do have a very important role in defending their understanding of national interests, which may be more assertive than that of the men with whom they work. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, that's the thing I wanted to get to, because you, you as a proud feminist, a feminist author, feminist professor, weren't you hoping that, that women could demonstrate there's a different way to handle international affairs than using military force all the time? Well, I'm not sure they were always using military force. I mean, to be fair, Kirkpatrick was critical of the Bush administration for going too far on Iraq and Afghanistan and so on. I think a lot of times they simply wanted to use sanctions, and certainly Albright was big on tough sanctions uh, in the case of, um, of Serbia. I think uh, we can argue that uh, Clinton was very tough on sanctions on Iran. Uh, so they weren't always into military force, but they were certainly very tough and very assertive. I think if you're going to lead a sovereign state, you probably have to absorb the norms about how you defend national security very assertively well, if you that, want to keep your job. That's the question, though, because uh, there was a study in the book, page 21, I saw it, suggesting that more female representation, the more there is in a country's parliament, the less likely a country will act violently on the world stage. And yet you chronicle four women who were very much associated with acts of violence on the world stage. Very much so. And much of that research suggests, now that we have more women to study, that women parliamentarians are very different from women in the political executive, which is why I wanted to study women who had cabinet jobs in the political executive, because I think the expectations are very different. Often women legislators are more responsive to a population that maybe doesn't want to see so much conflict and doesn't want to see uh, intervention of a military variety. Whereas in a political executive, it seems to me you're often getting problems that have been kicked down the road for a long time, and maybe there aren't too many other options, or maybe you simply have to get into more enforcement of your non-military options. Well, that, okay, that, that uh, may have anticipated my next question, which is, which, and Jeannie Kirkpatrick says in the book that, that in her experience, female legislators were very interested in child care policy, health care policy, education policy, much more so than their male counterparts. But it's clearly not the case in foreign policy. The women are just as tough and macho as the men are. These women have, with the exception of Hillary Clinton, have not come up through legislative office. Right. You mentioned that Hillary yeah. Clinton did have a career in the U.S. Senate, and we know that she was a senator from New York the day of the 9-11 attacks. Mm -hmm. And we know that she was very, very close with the Bush administration because she wanted to see lots of money spent in New York on reconstruction after those attacks. And she was very close with the administration. She believed in a bipartisan foreign policy because she was also the spouse of a former president mm -hmm. who knew what happened if the United States looked divided in the eyes of the world. So I think the three who don't come up through legislative office are having a socialization process, we'd say, that's very different from your, your average legislator. And certainly Hillary Clinton wasn't your average legislator either because she'd come out of the White House as a first lady. But do the, do the, in, in your experience, having looked at it, do the women political leaders feel a need to be even more macho and tougher than the men in order to be, quote, unquote, taken seriously by the male political establishment? Well, I think the four women I studied were always very tough and assertive long before they got these jobs. Hmm. So I argue that Kirkpatrick, in her role as a public intellectual, was extremely combative. Albright, in her uh, training of Dukakis and uh, Geraldine Ferraro and others, was extremely pointed in the need not to be compromising on, uh, on national security um, uh, priorities. Hmm. Certainly, Condoleezza Rice's history as a provost at Stanford was very combative. She told people, if the students were going to have a uh, strike or a sit-in at her office, the hell could freeze over before she would compromise. That's right. That is true. Uh, and Hillary Clinton as well, if you look at her, her, her background as a legislator, um, was not somebody who was prepared to back down in the face of uh, mm. threats, whether it was on Afghanistan or Iraq or anything else. So I think they had a long history of um, a sort of a willingness to be uh, in the conflict zone, combative, uh, very uh, feisty in their approach. Um, and I think that that is probably quite different from the uh, process of socialization that someone would go through to get a, a nomination and run for office and be mm -hmm. a legislator according to the usual trajectory. Which of the four, in your view, made the decisions that advanced the cause of women the most? 
Well, I think it would have to be Albright or, or Clinton. And possibly Albright, because she was the pioneer uh, and often the model uh, for Hillary Clinton. Clinton advised her husband to uh, appoint Albright uh, as Secretary of State. And Albright was the first to do something that we see our foreign minister doing, which is to create networks of women decision makers. Albright created a network of women ambassadors to the UN, a network of women foreign ministers. My students always ask, how did she do this? I said, well, she just needed a very small table in her kitchen. There were so few of them uh, that she would gather together. But she worked very hard. In fact, she was uh, responsible in part for recruiting our own um, Madam Justice Louise Arbour as the first woman chief prosecutor on the Yugoslavia war crimes, war crimes trial. tribunal. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I think, I think Albright made some pioneering uh, contributions that others in the U.S. and elsewhere have emulated. You didn't mention her in the book, but uh, Canada's foreign minister. Yeah, I guess if you do a sequel, you might need a chapter for her. There's Christian Freeland. How does she fit into this book? Well, Christian Freeland uh, certainly fits in very well in that she's not, also not coming out of legislative office. She's coming out of uh, journalism, not political science. Uh, but I think she's faced many of the criticisms uh, that the women in this book have faced, uh, often a very personalized... Uh, approach. I was, I was struck, for example, this summer when Christopher Freeland made comments about the human rights regime in Saudi Arabia. I noticed that we saw newspaper columnists accusing her of committing one of the worst diplomatic gaps in recent times of being amateurish, stumbling about, mishandling issues, general incoherence. I mean, a lot of these criticisms that she's been subjected to, I think, are also very similar to those that these American women face, which was questioning their capability to do the job. Not so much about decisions they made, but do they actually have what it takes? And she's consistently pushed back, as they did. Mm. Having said that, I'm not sure there's a, a, a cabinet minister in the Justin Trudeau government who has received as much praise for her competence on the file as Krista Freeland has. That's fair to say, too, I think, isn't it? I think, I think she's been extremely strong, arguably the strongest member of that, mm -hmm. uh, of that cabinet. And to the credit of the prime minister, he has not backed down. We've seen President Trump, for example, criticize. We we're very unhappy with the negotiations and the negotiating style mm -hmm. of Canada. We don't like their representative very much. Uh, our prime minister did not back down in the face of a very personalized uh, a set of comments, both by the U.S. chief negotiator and by the U.S. president, about our chief negotiator. Let's finish up on this then. Uh, here's a quote from your book. A former British Labour MP once said, the special virtues of women are singularly ill-adapted to diplomatic life. You're having written this book. What would you say to that fella? I would say many of these women have been crucial to the crafting of, uh, of foreign policy in our times, including our current minister. I think they will, in historical uh, uh, accounts, be considered pivotal uh, to, uh, in, in the case of these four women, uh, foreign policy in the, uh, in the Reagan years and since. So, uh, I, you know, I think he was highly underestimating their capacities. And one last question. That's the cover of your book. Who's that? That's Minerva. Uh, she was the uh, Roman goddess of uh, war and wisdom, and she's in the uh, Library of Congress on the wall, a, a very lovely mosaic. And a very nice-looking book cover as well. Thank you. Women as Foreign Policy Leaders. That's Sylvia Bashevkin. Sylvia, as always, we're grateful for your time here at TVO. Thank you, Steve. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.